evening to have as our guest speaker, Ken Tarbaugh. Uh, Ken is the president of Team Rubicon Global, a group that organizes veterans for disaster relief missions. Uh, he is also a U.S. Navy veteran, uh, served as uh, aircraft commander for combat reconnaissance missions and Operation Enduring Freedom and also Operation Southern Watch. Please join me in welcoming Ken Harbaugh. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Uh, can everyone hear me if I, if I use my grown-up voice? Are we good in the back there? I'm guessing we got a few vets in the house tonight. I see a Navy hat. Any, uh, any Marine Corps? Oh, come on, there's gotta be a few. All right, a few back there. I'll make sure to talk slow for you guys. <laughs> um, I am incredibly honored uh, to be back in Medina. I say back in Medina because I married a Medina girl 20 years ago. Uh, her parents are still talking to me. They are right there, Anna Marie and John. Um, honored uh, to have you out. Uh, and it very much uh, feels like home every time I come back to Medina. And the fact that you're doing this here, the Veterans Roundtable, and welcoming my generation of veterans is incredibly meaningful to me because it's a reminder that the, the, the path forward for vets like me and buddies like, uh, like Tom in the back there um, who served in Iraq has been paved by your generation, by the generations that came before. And the wisdom we can glean from conversations like this, uh, I think is, is wisdom that we need to pass down because I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna talk about some of this today. That path can be rocky at times, the transition back to civilian life, as you all know. One of the, the things that I discovered was helpful and have been lucky enough to share that with thousands of other veterans is the idea of serving again, is the idea of repurposing the skills and experiences that I acquired during my time in uniform and channeling them for another mission, another purpose. For me, that purpose has been Team Rubicon, a disaster relief organization that has retrained now 50,000 military vets to go into disaster zones like Puerto Rico after Hurricane Harvey, uh, Houston after, uh, her, actually Puerto Rico was Maria, Houston after Hurricane Harvey. We still got vets on the ground there helping out. Uh, one of my most recent missions was to, uh, I was just telling um, Cindy, a refugee camp for Iraqis and Syrians displaced by ISIS. And I remember arriving with my, with my ruck on and being processed into the operation, getting the onboarding brief, and the nurse from the advance team went through the inventory of what I had in my bag and she saw a portable ultrasound. And she literally buckled at the knees and said, Ken, you might have just saved a baby because we've got a complicated pregnancy here and we had no idea how to address it how to deal with it, and this portable ultrasound might make the difference between life and death. When I talk about purpose, that's the kind of purpose I'm talking about giving my generation to vets when they come back, when they take off the uniform. Uh, I wanna give you the story of Team Rubicon and then would love uh, if we have time to do some Q&A, but I'll start with a video. A full-blown hurricane from the Middle of the Gulf bounced back out to sea, came in, hovered over Houston as a tropical storm, one of the worst floods in the history of the United States. When you see people's lives floating in water, it, it gets you. 80% of the homes have been wiped out. It's kind of a strange feeling. You have no idea what's going to happen. This is going to be the biggest operation we've ever attempted, and they're doing everything from supporting with logistics to operations. In Team Rubicon, we believed that the veterans were the ideal people for disaster response. I'm an Army veteran, so to see that there was a veteran organization helping people in the community, I wanted to be a part of it. Most people join Team Rubicon because they are looking for that sense of purpose. It's a really good place for us to show what we've got. I prayed this morning to send me some help. With the help of Team Rubicon, I know that my purpose in life is to continue to serve. I got my sense of purpose back. I felt like I was part of a family again. <laughs> We're trying to mobilize volunteers from across the country. We've got the best team in the world. We're 
committed to sticking around the city of Houston. There's no way you can turn a blind eye out to any of this damage. It's heartbreaking. And they said, it's okay, everything will be all right. We're here to help you. We are so grateful. As long as that flag's still flying, I'm gonna do what's best for this country. This is what our America is about. Our country is coming together. I'm proud to be a part of Team Blue They see us and they see hope, and they see that there's help coming their way. America was built on an ideal of neighbors helping neighbors, communities coming together as one. To donate or learn more, please visit TeamRubiconUSA.org. Pretty great, huh? 50,000 of us today. It started with eight. A couple of Marines, some medics, and some doctors that went down to Haiti after the massive earthquake that leveled Port-au-Prince in 2010. 50,000 strong today. But I often get the question, how the heck did you wind up running this organization? Weren't you that uh, scrawny Navy pilot who in 98 swooped into Medina and, uh, and, and convinced a Medina girl to marry him and spent the nine years doing combat recon missions? Um, yeah, and I guess that's the beginning of my story, and I, I think we'll, we'll start there because I'm sure a lot of you can relate. Uh, that is me straight out of officer candidate school, and nine years later, um, I'm done with my Navy career. I am on my way to the out-processing clerk's station about to sign my DD-214. How many of you remember what a DD-214 is? Yeah, it's that piece of paper, front and back, a single sheet for those of you who don't know, that summarizes an entire military career. And it is filled up for me with missions over North Korea and, and over the Middle East, Operation Southern Watch and Enduring Freedom. A lot to write about packed two pages of DD-214, except for one empty block. I think it's block 224, the signature block. And once you sign that empty signature block, you're out, you're done. You're no longer on active duty. And I remember <clears throat> a sharp contrast between the feeling I felt driving to the out-processing clerk station, thinking, I've got my life ahead of me. I'm gonna go back to school. I'm gonna make my way as a civilian being incredibly excited and optimistic about that, and then sitting down and staring at that empty block 24 and realizing once I signed my name, I didn't know who I, who I was anymore. I was giving up a real core part of my identity. Um, my, my wife makes me put it in here because it, it, I guess, uh, imposes a dose of humility on the Navy pilot. This is me a year after signing that, uh, that signature block. She calls this, a lot of veterans talk about the transition back to, uh, to civilian life. She calls this the, uh, the BA to FA transition, which stands for uh, badass to fat ass transition. Uh, didn't take very long, but I had a moment <laughs> During law school, I had just come back from Afghanistan where this picture was taken, and that sense of uh, a loss of purpose, uh, the disconnect from my community, my military buddies, hit me like a ton of bricks. I was sitting in a cafe across the street from the, the college, and a couple of army trucks rumbled by. They were probably from, from one of the nearby armories. But a, a student sitting next to me said loud enough for everyone here to hear, trying to be funny, uh, what, is there a war going on? This was 2005. Not only was there one war going on, there were two. And, and I got upset. Something in me snapped. I remember standing up, knocking over my coffee because I wanted to let this kid have a, a piece of my mind. I had been there. I had friends who were still there. I had friends who were never coming back. And this kid saw fit to throw out a sarcastic comment about there being a war going on. But I realized in time, just in time, that it, it wasn't this kid's fault. That we have built these bubbles ourselves. And we have asked the 1% who are doing the fighting to do it without any real connection to those of us they are fighting for. 
And I resolved then and there to, to do something about that. I wasn't sure what, but a couple of weeks later, I got word that a buddy of mine had been blown up in a suicide truck bomb attack in Fallujah. And I found myself almost in a daze driving down to Bethesda Naval Hospital. That's where our Marines begin their long step to recovery, many of them. That's their first stop when they get back to the States. They go through Bethesda Naval Hospital. And I had this, this naive idea that I was driving down there to give them some encouragement and some comfort and some company. And when I got there and began talking to them, exactly the opposite thing happened. Every single one of them reassured me about the strength of this country, country, because every single one of them said, in their own way, that they wanted to get back to their units. Now, I knew from the extent of their injuries that a lot of them wouldn't be able to make it back to their units, but what they were really saying was that they wanted to be useful again. That just because they had been sent home, just because they might be hurt, didn't mean they were giving up on being of service to their country. And I'll never forget what one of these young Marines said to me as he was about to be wheeled into his 10th reconstructive surgery. He said, sir, I, Marines, they always start with sir, right? He said, sir, I lost my legs, but that's it. I didn't lose my desire to serve or my pride in being an American. And that idea was the catalyst for this larger movement to reshape the way we talk about my generation of returning vets, so that we see them as assets, not liabilities, so that one day everyone will want a veteran as a neighbor, will put veterans at the top of the resume stack when they're doing interviews. My dad did three tours in Vietnam, and the welcome home he received, I dare say the welcome home his entire generation received, was not the welcome home they deserved. And I felt upon hearing this that we had a pretty narrow window to change that for my generation, to change the narrative, to change the way we welcome them home. I co-founded an organization that was committed to giving these veterans a sense of renewed purpose, community, and identity. That morphed into Team Rubicon, which, as I alluded to earlier, got its start in the wake of that massive earthquake that leveled Port-au-Prince in Haiti. When a couple of Marines saw scenes like this on their TVs and they realized, you know what? That looks a heck of a lot like what we just came back from in Iraq and Afghanistan. Maybe we can be useful down there. And literally, with nothing more than the rucks on their backs, they headed down. They pulled together a couple of their medic buddies and some surgeons, and they were one of the very first relief teams on the ground in Port-au-Prince. Within 24 hours, that team was running the last significant full-service hospital in Port-au-Prince because a lot of the, many of the doctors were dead. A lot of them uh, were focused on immediate family, and these Marines and medics and American surgeons realized that they had what it took to function in an environment like this. Not just the will to do it, which is what got them there, but the ability to perform under extreme conditions, the ability to solve problems with a bare minimum of resources, the ability to lead teams of different kinds of people thrown together at the last minute. I joined uh, Team Rubicon uh, the operational side as chief operations officer in time for the just in time two weeks ahead of the largest storm in recorded human history Typhoon Haiyan which struck the Philippines in 2013 if this storm had hit the United States its outer bands would have stretched from Los Angeles to Maine it packed sustained winds of 196 miles an hour sustained winds it saw gusts approaching 250. Everywhere we went in the Philippines, we saw devastation like this. One of the toughest things in a post-disaster environment is knowing where you can apply your resources, how many of these calls for help you can answer. That's one of the most heartbreaking things you have to deal with in a post-disaster environment. But we flew in on one of the first 
Marine Corps C-130s into Tacloban, the epicenter of this storm. Uh, we immediately created our operation plan to, uh, to get out into the outlying regions. When we landed, what we saw confirmed our worst fears. The airfield itself, which was a Philippine Air Force base, had been completely, completely decimated. And we knew the outlying areas were going to be even harder hit. Uh, we bunkered down for the evening, and at first light, we hopped on Philippine Air Force Hueys. Uh, I'm sure, looking at uh, some of the gray hair here, a lot of you flew around on Hueys, right? Well, these are the ones we gave them after Vietnam. Single engine, not double, not uh, twin engine Hueys. And they were heroic in the aftermath of this typhoon, getting us and our teams and the aid into where it needed to go. Flying down the coast, we saw 100 miles of devastation like this mile after mile after mile inland, and then 100 miles of coast, utterly devastated, village after village after village. We were able to establish a clinic in the remains of the town hall in Tanoan, uh, which is south of Tacloban, the only building with structurally sound walls still standing. We set up this clinic, and the thing you have to remember about the post-disaster environment is that the people you're, you're receiving are not coming in on ambulances. They are walking. If they're really lucky, they're riding in on the back of a moped because the roads are completely impassable. A lot of them are taking 24 hours to get there. And when they arrive, you're dealing with the kinds of injuries that we never would have seen in Iraq and Afghanistan because we're at least getting care to them early there. You're seeing uh, infection that's had 24, sometimes 48 hours to fester. But I tell you, having a team of, medic, of um, combat medics, veterans at your side is exactly what you want because they're not going to buckle under that pressure. I include this slide in here because the, the stark beauty of the, the backdrop and the clouds and the sky really belie the horror of what's going on in the foreground. Uh, that there on the roof is, is my friends Bob and Chris, and they are putting a roof on top of the operating wing of our clinic, which didn't start as a clinic. It started as City Hall. The operating table was two desk tables shoved together with a piece of clear tarp. Until we got this roof on there, the surgeons were literally operating under a blue tarp held up by bits of string. And Chris, uh, on the left there, told me later that this was the toughest thing he'd ever had to do. Because for 13 hours, as he was making it so these doctors could operate in a dry OR, he had to look down on that operating table. Chris was in the French Foreign Legion on a sniper team in Africa. He saw some pretty horrific things. He said this was the toughest thing he'd ever had to do. Every once in a while, there was a a ray of light through these dark, dark moments. One of those was a, a mother who came in ready to deliver late one night. And again, a complicated delivery. We did not have a portable ultrasound in this case. And the surgeon said, we're going to need to do a C-section. And we can't do it at night. Even with all of our headlamps, even with all the lights we could find, there just wasn't enough light to safely get that baby out by C-section. And so we had to get her through the night. And all night long, we took turns comforting this woman to make it to sunrise. I, I got to tell you, I have never been so happy to see the sun in my life. When it was just high enough over the horizon, we got to work. The OBGYNs got to work. We got the baby out. Uh, we stabilized the mom. Uh, we saved two lives that night. Once the immediate medical issues are dealt with, or at least under control in a disaster environment like this, you turn your attention to providing relief. And this is where the Marine Corps came in real handy. They flew us around on their Ospreys, dropping off aid, dropping off recon teams as well, because the other part of the disaster response effort is making sure you have an accurate picture of where the aid needs to go. Uh, for that, we would fly in a four-person team with some uh, Philippine Special Forces security. 
we would drop them in uh, to an LZ uh, landing zone. They would spend as much time as they needed to reconnoiter the, the area, uh, asking things like, is there a functioning government in this town that can receive and distribute the aid? Uh, where are the mass graves in relation to the wells? Is there, is there potable water? Are there landing zones where we can get a big food drop? You pass all that information to a, a centralized collection point, then you can share that with the larger response effort to make sure aid isn't being wasted. Uh, on this mission in particular, we were dropping aid into, uh, I believe, Tolosa, which our security brief said was was going to be pretty rough. The advice we got was to land as far away from the city center as we could in an open cane field because we, we, we would be least likely there to be overrun by a bunch of really desperate, hungry villagers. And I remember being in the Osprey, that's the Marine Corps airplane that uh, can take off like a helicopter, fly like a plane. I remember looking out the bubble window and thinking, this looks like a pretty good place to put down because there's nobody around. Within minutes of us touching down there, there was a crowd of about 400 people. They had been chasing the airplane by foot through the cane field. They were, they were so desperate. My last view, uh, I just gave away the punchline, but pretend you didn't see that. My last view of my four-person team was lifting off out of this cane field and seeing my four red helmets, my team members, being rushed by 400 desperate villagers. And I thought, oh boy, I don't know how this is gonna, how this is gonna turn out. Well, this is them six hours, eight hours later on a beach after the mission. Um, clearly our fears were, were, were unfounded. I have never encountered people as, as generous, as friendly, as, as giving as the Filipinos we were there to help. On that mission, that's Chris, by the way, the French Foreign Legionnaire. Uh, he told me they shared their food with him, which is hard to imagine, hard to imagine, because everywhere I went, I saw them desperately trying to dry out their rice in the open fields because it had been ruined, it had been completely swamped, and every time it rained, because it's monsoon season, they would have to sweep it all back up. Yet they found a way to share their food with our crews that were doing their recon missions. At the end of long days like this, we always made an effort to gather around a campfire. And on every Team Rubicon mission, we do that, whether it's a real campfire like this or the proverbial campfire, we sit around and we share stories. We talk about what we did that day, why it was important. And when I think about the cathartic effect of finding that renewed purpose, that sense of service, this is how you realize it. When we do missions in the states, and the vast majority of our Team Rubicon missions are, are stateside, one of the most powerful experiences is sitting around this campfire, talking about the day you had, and then letting that bleed into stories about your time in the service. And every once in a while, we'll get a Vietnam vet in Team Rubicon who will share a story about their time in the military, and more importantly, their reintegration back into civilian life and what was successful for them or what didn't work for them. And having my buddies hear that and realize that the path has been laid is one of the most powerful things we can do for these vets uh, who, who joined Team Rubicon to find that renewed sense of purpose. Magic that we've hit upon in Team Rubicon is this realization that we've got two problems that can be turned into mutually reinforcing solution. On the one hand, we have an increasing number of disasters worldwide. On the other, we have a veteran population in this country that is primed to go tackle those disasters. Millions coming back from the wars over the last 17 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, desperate for that sense of renewed purpose and community and identity. We're turning them into disaster responders. Uh, these are veterans deployed uh, right now to places like Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Harvey. The science of how we deploy these vets, it's not an art form any longer. We are plugged in to the national architecture for responding to disasters. We work hand in glove with the Red Cross and FEMA and 
here in, in summary is, is how a domestic deployment would run from, uh, from start to finish. So this would be a tornado somewhere in the states. Our recon team arrives and begins scouting out. Uh, this is an actual satellite shot uh, that, that um, we commission of a disaster area that we're invited to respond to. Uh, recon team goes out and we get more finely honed satellite imagery uh, with the tasking uh, of a satellite that, that is assigned to us, at least part of its bandwidth. That gives us a very high-res picture of the area that we need to go into uh, and address the damage. Also helps us identify the FOB. Some of you know what a FOB is, right? Forward Operating Base. Uh, you'll see that a lot of our Team Rubicon terminology mirrors our experience in the military. We set up that Forward Operating Base. That becomes the, the seat of our, uh, of our operation and receives the first shipment of disaster relief supplies. We build that FOB, which includes uh, decontamination areas, it includes satellite uplinks so that we can communicate with our, our headquarters. And then we begin bringing in our, our response team, starting with our incident management team, which are our most experienced veterans, the ones who are going to lead this operation. Once we have the groundwork laid, the volunteers start to pour in. And with 50,000 in the U.S. alone now, we can pull them in really quickly. Uh, sometimes in a matter of hours, we start getting volunteers pulled in, briefed into the operation. We track everywhere the volunteer goes, every hour that they commit to the operation, so that we have an accurate uh, report to deliver to that community after the operation is completed as to how much value we delivered. No community is ever charged for Team Rubicon parachuting in and helping out. <clears throat> the first volunteer teams do the damage assessments at the neighborhood and even sometimes the structural level. Those damage assessments lead to work orders that then lead to teams coming out and performing the actual work of the response, helping those homeowners in, that, in their path to recovery. <clears throat> this is where the lion's share of the work is done. You have the incident management team at the top that rolls in early, a handful of really experienced folks. The damage assessment teams, um, also of air experience, and then the strike teams, which do the lion's share of the work. They're all trained, of course, but it only takes, uh, it takes a, a minimum of training. It's a low bar to get on a Team Rubicon strike team uh, and get out there helping out with the, the muckouts, the, the teardowns, uh, the lowest level of the recovery operation. One of the most important aspects of the response is making sure it has a long tail. That we don't just wrap up our FOB, wrap up our equipment and leave. We hand it off to a community partner that is going to be there for the long term to help that community over the, the, the years following the disaster. So that's a well, thanks. That's a a typical domestic operation for Team Rubicon in the United States. 
My mandate for the last couple of years was to take it global. Kind of a crazy idea, but when you look at where the American military has been and what we've had to do for the last 17, we have led a coalition of more than 50 countries in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere around the world. And General Petraeus uh, came to Team Rubicon USA and said, we need to do right by these, these other veterans that we've led through 17 years of war. Do you think we can share this idea with the Aussies, with the Brits, with the Canadians? And we said, we'll try. And so I became president of Team Rubicon Global. And my mission was to take this incredibly inspiring, successful model that we've proven in the US and share it with these coalition countries. We've had a tremendous amount of success doing that. We are active now in Australia, in, in Canada, in Norway. Uh, we're looking at Germany. The UK is probably our, our most successful international Team Rubicon to date. Uh, we got a nice little recruiting boost when a fellow military aviator, also a, uh, a redhead, decided to join Team Rubicon UK. Um, anybody want to take a guess who the guy in the back right is? You know? Yeah, that's Prince Harry. He joined the team and dropped in on one of our operations in Nepal. Until, until the paparazzi figured out where he was. I don't know how they get to Nepal, but they found him eventually. Um, but that has been my job uh, over, over the last couple of years, and I think a, a great example, see if I got another one here, great example of why that's been so successful is an operation like Go Big in, uh, in Louisiana, where the global coalition of Team Rubicons the, the Canadians and the Brits and the Aussies. It looks like we had the Norwegians there as well. When an American community got hit, they all came to our aid. And that to me is a reminder that, that service in uniform even transcends, uh, transcends national boundaries. There's something about serving one's country, even if it's a different country, that binds you to each other. It's that, that ethic of service of, of living for something greater than yourself. And seeing that in action in a disaster zone with veterans from countries around the world is just such a humbling and an inspiring thing. I want to make sure we have time for Q&A. Uh, maybe we'll take a vote. Do you want to hear about the firefighting we're getting into or jump straight to Q&A? Uh, firefighting, uh, yeah? All right, we'll do the firefighting. One of the, and this was a tough call because firefighting is a pretty high risk business, but in 20, 15, the Bureau of Land Management came to me and said, the approaching wildfire season is projected to be the worst in history. And we're talking mostly about the West Coast, Alaska down to, to Baja. They were not ready. They did not have the bodies to tackle these fires. They came to Team Rubicon because they knew the capability we had, mostly in the form of our members, and they said, can you help? Can you help us out? Can you train us enough firefighters to at least hold the line on these fires? Uh, we thought about it and said, yeah, if, if ever there was a mission that our guys and gals could handle, it would be something like this, wildland firefighting. So in the um, spring leading up to that summer wildland firefighting season, we trained hundreds of wildland firefighters. We've trained thousands up till this point, and sure enough, that 2015 season was horrific. 5,000 separate fires burned from Alaska down to Baja, and we had our crews out there fighting on them. Uh, and for me, the most powerful thing about this partnership was just how much it resembled a military operation. I'm going to preview this video because I want you to listen and I want to contextualize it. I went through the wildland firefighter training with the Team Rubicon team, not because I thought I was tough enough to actually get out on a fire, but because I wanted to understand what my crews were going through. And I got to tell you, after four days of that, after four days on the line in training, I was completely broken. And these guys and a few gals are out there for weeks on end, sunrise to sunset, dig and trench, protecting homes, protecting lives, uh, and it is in a very real way like a military operation for, for, um, for the guys doing it, certainly for our military veterans. 
And one of the most powerful moments in that training came at the end when the Wildland uh, Fire crew chief shared some audio with us from the Granite Mountain uh, disaster. A movie came out about that. Tom, do you remember the name of the movie? Um, a couple, Only the Brave. About these 19 firefighters killed on Granite Mountain trying to save homes, save lives. And the thing about that audio tape, listening to it as a vet surrounded by other vets, is when you heard that call for air support that these firefighters were making, it sounded a lot like a call some of us had, had made in, in Iraq. When you heard the call for help um, that these firefighters were making, it sounded like the call for help that a lot of my buddies had made from Afghanistan. It hit us right here in the gut. I'm going to play this video and pause it and explain what you're hearing. And hearing the Granite Mountain hotshots react to the shifting flames, what you're seeing now comes from another firefighter's helmet camera. He was not with the hotshots. But you can hear the final radio transmissions just moments before the men died. So that's the part I um, I wanted you to hear. The um I'm gonna let it finish. With silence. The part I wanted you to hear was the chainsaws in the background. You could just make them out. That was the sound of the Granite Mountain hotshot crew chainsaws running as they're calling for air support. Air support being the water tankers or the retardant tankers that they're hoping will find them and drop in on them. And the reason that is such a gut-wrenching sound, the sound of those chainsaws, is that when, when you're surrounded by an encroaching fire, your last resort is to clear an area, clear an area of brush, get all of the fuel or the limbs, the trees, far enough away that you can hunker down uh, in your, it's, it's like a sleeping bag, but it's a last ditch shelter that should protect you if the fire runs over you. Um, you need to clear an area to make that happen though. And their buddies hearing those chainsaw running knew that's what they were doing. They were trying to clear that area. But as hot as that fire was, as hot as that fire was, they would have needed to clear, in the minutes they had left, they would have needed to clear 40 acres. 40 acres of brush and scrub in order to be safe from a fire. It was, it was just that much of a furnace. Uh, so when the f crew chief played this for, for our team of veterans and we heard the, the sound of those radio calls and the desperation in those voices, we felt a real kinship with those firefighters. When I talk about giving veterans that renewed sense of mission uh, and community, I'm talking about giving them missions like this. That's uh, just a, a shot of me at one of my very last missions to this refugee camp in, uh, for the Iraqis and Syrians displaced by ISIS. Um, all right, I'll tell you one more story and then let's go to q and I'm keeping an eye on the clock. To me, the, the best proof that we're doing right, not only by the disaster victims who were helping on the worst days of their lives, but by the veterans we bring in, is, is captured by this, this picture here. Ryan Creel on the right there has since become a great friend of mine. He and I met riding in a pickup truck in Longmont, Colorado in the aftermath of a uh, devastating flood, a hundred year flood that wiped out this town in, in the Rockies of Colorado. I remember riding up to a bridge with Ryan, who was the strike team leader um, on this mission. We rode up to a bridge, or at least where a bridge should have been, and we looked over an empty chasm at this, at this broken concrete below us and no river where the river should have been. This flood was so powerful that it not only 
knocked out this concrete bridge in the first few hours, it shifted the entire river 100 yards to the west through what had been a community. That's the kind of devastation that this flood um, wreaked upon Longmont, Colorado. And it was, it was pretty tough to see. The work we did there was pretty tough as well. Uh, a person lost their life in this flood. We were dealing with that uh, in addition to the physical devastation. But in the midst of all that, covered in, in mud and muck, uh, and sometimes when you're working in, in a, an environment like this, you get banged up a little too, so Ryan was a little bloody as well. He turned to me and said, I don't think I've ever been happier in my life. And I knew what he meant, because he had found a new mission in life. You see, Ryan had been a combat photographer assigned with US Delta Forces in Iraq. As part of his job, he was embedded with a special forces team working alongside Iraqi special forces in places like Baghdad and Fallujah. And his job wasn't only to document the the missions that those special forces were conducting and completing. The worst part of his job was to document the fatalities as the combat photographer. And when he talked about what that meant for his Iraqi buddies, it wasn't usually getting killed in the line of fire during a raid. It was being dragged from their homes in the middle of the night and tortured and left on their family's doorstep the next morning. And Ryan had to go photograph that. Needless to say, he came back from that experience. He would tell you himself a shell of his former self. I did not know that we still use electroshock therapy, but Ryan got electroshock therapy. His brain was so badly wired. He spent six months in an inpatient facility trying to fix his brain and very nearly took his own life. He was so desperate to end the pain, but he knew that if he could find a way to serve again, he would have a reason to keep living. And he found that sense of purpose through Team Rubicon, uh, through serving on missions like this. On one of these missions, he met Vanessa, who coincidentally happens to also be a, uh, a combat photographer, but with the Air Force. She's also a vet found her sense of purpose serving with Team Rubicon again. They got engaged on one of these missions, and in Longmont, Colorado, they realized, <clears throat> you know what, if, if a wedding is nothing more than a chance to profess your commitment to each other in front of a community that's gonna hold you accountable for that commitment, let's do it on a Team Rubicon mission. And so we set a chapel in, uh, you saw the FOB, Ford Operating Base, on the earlier video, right? Our FOB, in this case, was a Home Depot parking lot. We set up a chapel in the Home Depot parking lot. Uh, the chapel itself, you know those huts that they're trying to sell you in the back of the parking lot? That's the chapel in the back that we hung the flag in. The pews are those orange Homer buckets, those $5 Homer buckets. And instead of a, a sword arch, uh, we had a shovel arch that we made them walk down. I'm, I'm one of the, uh, the shovel bearers in the back right. Uh, admittedly, a low budget wedding, but probably one of the, the coolest weddings I have ever been a part of. And an ultimate testament to the power of Team Rubicon to rebuild that sense of, uh, of community. I'm gonna end there, uh, would love to, to take questions if we got time, we got a few minutes, right? Great, okay, well they're coming already, yes sir. <laughs> How many team members lose their life, not only in the fires, but some of the other activities that you're involved in? Uh, it, the, the question is about team members that have lost their lives with Team Rubicon. I will tell you the thing I worry about most, and I worry about it almost every day, um, I'm going to throw out a number for you and I'm going to see some nodding heads I'm sure, is the 22 a day. And that's the number of veterans who take their own lives. That's what we're really trying to address here. And I've lost buddies in Team Rubicon to that statistics. Uh, that, that is the real monster that we're trying to defeat is that monster of veteran suicide. I'll tell you one story about that because I think we're winning the war, at least in Team Rubicon. I got a call a couple of years ago 
from a Team Rubicon buddy who said, I've got a friend in crisis. He's right at the end of his rope, and, and he told me he's, he's going to take his own life. He called me not so I would talk him out of it, but to apologize. I'm sure some of you have had a conversation like this. He called me to say, it's not your fault, Eric. Uh, it's no one's fault. I just can't live with the nightmares anymore, and, and, and I'm going to take my own life. Thank God it was the day before Halloween, because Eric's buddy, the, the Team Rubicon member who was in that mo moment of crisis, also said, I'm not going to do it today <clears throat> because Halloween is my niece's favorite holiday, and I don't want to ruin it for her. That gave us 24 hours. And we got the gears in motion. We, behind the scenes, Eric's friend didn't know any of this was going on. We have a full-time mental health clinician on staff at Team Rubicon. We brought Dane into the conversation to make sure we were getting the best direction, the best advice possible. And Eric knew exactly what to do for his buddy. We got him on the first plane out to Denver. Um, on the way, we're going down the checklist. One of the things we've implemented at Team Rubicon is a broad-based training system. So in addition to the full-time mental health clinician that is always on call, we have now thousands of people, regular volunteers, trained in ASSIST, Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. So you're never, if you're a member of Team Rubicon, more than one phone call away from somebody who's been trained to intervene in a crisis like this. So that's, the, um, that's the, the real monster we face. And we have lost a few uh, due to suicide. I've been to more funerals than I want to talk about for Team Rubicon members and other veterans. But I know we have saved many, many, many more lives than we've lost. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Would you please take us on a recce mission over North Korea? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> that, that sounds like a counter intel question. <laughs> I'm not sure how specific I can be. Um, the aircraft I flew was an EP3, Signals Intelligence. Uh, and the, I'm going to be intentionally vague. I'm trying to, to respect the, the spirit of the question. But our mission was to soak up signals, get as close as we could. Uh, without obviously antagonizing too much or, or getting shot down, um, and then delivering that information back to the, the NSA or, or whoever the, the collection agency that was tasking us uh, needed it. Uh, as far as afterburner and altitude, um, I'm going to let you guess on that one. <laughs> Single. Single play, single crew. Uh, that was, I graduated, I was a walk on. Uh, John and Anna Marie might be able to tell you this. I wasn't an academy guy, uh, wasn't even an ROTC guy, but two thirds of the way through college, I had a moment where I realized I had done nothing to deserve the privileges I was enjoying as an American. And I was studying abroad at the time. That'll give you some perspective when you're overseas and realize just how good we got it. The very week I got back to the States, I walked into the recruiter's office and I said, um, I'd like to be a Navy pilot. <laughs> and they said, well, you can't just walk in here and do that. Turns out you can. They take a couple off the street a year. That's what they, uh, they referred to me as a walk-on or an off-the-street accession. Uh, 13 weeks, I graduated 13 weeks later. I finished officer candidate school. A year later, I, I, I had my wings and, uh, and was on my way to my deployable squadron. But having graduated at the top of my pilot training class, what you're supposed to do is go fly F-18s, right? You're supposed to go fly fighters if you have the choice. I wanted to fly recon because uh, I wanted to be at the, the tip of the spear collecting, collecting intel. And it was the best decision I ever made because of the crews I got to lead. Thanks for the question. Yes, ma'am. I don't. And I miss it. I miss it terribly. Um, but you know, life life catches up, and it takes so much of a. I don't know if there are any pilots in here, but so much of a time commitment to stay current and safe. I just can't give it what it deserves. I wish I did, though. Thanks. Yes, sir. This is a command and control question. Um, I'm curious. You talked about uh, doing this kind of thing. 
doing in, in other countries, and if you have a disaster in the United States, you may have local devastation, but you still have functional state government, right. functional federal government. You have pretty easy IFS and you're getting some instructions. I'm curious, when you go to a third world or developing country, just to know which groups are interested in helping, right. which groups are interested in, in improving their position, how, how do you it's tough. It's tough, but Team Rubicon has a rule that we never go in uninvited. You can easily become part of the larger disaster if you're one of these cowboy outfits that just shows up and wants to help but isn't plugged into the, the architecture of the existing response. But even then, even when you go in and invited, um, sometimes the politics on the ground make it really complicated. In, in Nepal, for example, I see Tom nodding, nodding his head. Tom actually ran the, the clinic in the refugee camp and some of the politics there were, were really, really tough. In Nepal, we had the army and the, the local police on different sides uh, because they each had their own political patron or something like that. Uh, and you, you had to be as much of a negotiator and diplomat as a disaster responder. But again, if you think about what veterans bring to, bring to the game, some of you have probably heard the term the strategic corporal. We ask so much of our military personnel in places like Iraq and Afghanistan interfacing with the locals. They are perfectly suited for this kind of work in a disaster environment. I'm assuming if you're, if you're uh, flying around on Ospreys, you have at least some, you know, some uh, formal backing from... Right. Well, that's the other unfair advantage we have. We have a great relationship with the U.S. military, uh, so we can, we can get in on that first C-130 into Tacloban. We can get manifested on that Osprey to get out there and be able to, ha be able to help quickly where other aid organizations might take them days or weeks. Yes? Two quick questions. One, where did the name Rubicon come from? And two, are your people permanent employees of Rubicon or are they employed elsewhere and when the whistle blows they put on a different on the Rubicon hat? Great question. The name Team Rubicon comes from the river that I see some more nodding heads. Any students of antiquity will recall that Caesar faced a, an irreversible choice when he was leading his army back into Italy to march on Rome. The the Senate told him, if you cross the Rubicon, the river in that part of northern Italy, there is no turning back. Well, when this crew of Team Rubicon volunteers got to Haiti, the initial uh, eight Team Rubicon volunteers, when they got to Haiti, they started in Dominican Republic. That was the only place to catch a flight to. And they took vehicles and went by vehicle and by foot to get into Haiti. And there's a river dividing Dominican Republic and Haiti. And everyone was telling them, don't cross that river, decided to go for it. They crossed the proverbial Rubicon, and I guess the rest is history. They've grown, we have grown from those original eight to 50,000 plus today because they, they took it upon themselves to, to, to cross and, and not turn back. The second question was, oh, staffing. Of the 50,000 volunteers, we manage that with a staff of less than 100 full-timers. And if you look at that ratio, that efficiency, this is not me beating up on the Red Cross, but the Red Cross's full-time to volunteer uh, ratio as a measure of efficiency is 1 to 16. Ours is 1 to 500. We get a heck of a lot done with a really lean core staff. We have a headquarters in LA. We have a operation center in Dallas. Uh, we have offices in DC, in Sydney, in uh, just outside of London, in, in Toronto, uh, with a very lean core staff of around 100. We manage an army, if you will, of over 50,000 volunteers ready to deploy whenever the balloon goes up. So they, when the whistle blows, they drop the other world? The volunteers, yes. And one of the, the most humbling things for me is seeing the lengths our volunteers go to to be able to deploy on a Team Rubicon mission. A lot of them will save up their vacation over the course of a year to be able to deploy with Team Rubicon for a week or two. Now one of the really neat things we're seeing lately is businesses treating 
uh, a Team Rubicon deployment for their employees like a National Guard deployment. In some cases, even paying them uh, while they're deployed with Team Rubicon because they see uh, not only the value for the communities that are being helped, but the value for their own members. And increasingly, with the volunteer density we have, we're deploying members in their hometowns. With 50,000 and growing, a lot of disasters uh, hit areas where Team Rubicon members live. I deployed to a, a tornado strike a couple of months ago in, in Northeast Ohio, and many of the Team Rubicon volunteers responding to that were from the area. Um, so they were able to get there really quickly. Yes, sir. How does one get involved with this? Google Team Rubicon. It'll be the only thing that pops up. Uh, we got a great boost during the World Series as uh, the World Series charity of choice this year. So we're, we're on the map now. Uh, if you Google Team Rubicon, the button, the, the biggest button on the page is join the team. We'd love to have you. Did you say that their web address is teamrubiconusa.org? Yes. If you want to remember all that, great, www.teamrubiconusa.org, or just Google Team Rubicon. Either one will get you there. Thank you. Yes? It doesn't matter all that you're talking about now, but wasn't that fire with all that loss of life, wasn't there one man that escaped and yes. tried to tell the others how to fight yes. the fire? Yes. Yes. They were not afraid. Well, they were afraid they were. to do what they were. The spotter, uh, there was a spotter um, up on the hillside, and, and I'm not going to second guess anything that crew did because um, they're all heroes in my mind. But there was a spotter, a 19 year old kid, if I recall, who was the sole survivor. Uh, and I can't imagine the, the, the heartache he is living with. Actually, I can because I think about a lot of my military buddies uh, and, and the similar pain that they have to uh, carry. Just a way to fight that, to get out. And they didn't do it. He yeah. went off on his own. He, I'm, I'm not sure about the particulars uh, of, of that, but like I said, I'm going to honor their memory by, by not second guessing their, uh, their decisions in that fire. Yes, ma'am. How do we get the financial backing? 99.9% .9 of it is from you, from the American people, from individuals, from, from foundations. A very, very small percentage has to come from the federal government now because by law, firefighters have to be paid uh, by the federal government. So that's the only piece uh, that we, we don't get from the American public at large, but it's a uh, publicly supported, uh, meaning um, through individual donations, it's, it's supported that way. Yeah, thanks. Yes. On, on the number of, of folks out of your 50,000, the number of people that are doing three or four events a year versus somebody like five years or something. I mean, it sounds like a pretty good Yes, we, we, we track all that in a very detailed way. I don't have, I don't have it off the top of my head. And, and for what it's worth, I formally stepped away from the organization. I'm still obviously emotionally committed to it, but I, I stepped away in July to, to run for Congress in, in Ohio. But um, the, the stats are kept, um, and we, we drill down into those in a, in a very detailed way. Yeah, uh, more than average, it sounds like, of folks that would do multiple. Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Ryan has probably done, the, the gentleman on that last slide, the Delta Force combat photographer, he's probably done half a dozen. I've seen him out there a few times. Thanks. Any others? Sir. Any given time, how many members might be out? It depends. During Hurricanes Harvey and Maria, we had a couple of thousand either in the process of mobilizing or on the ground. Uh, that's a pretty high op tempo when you think about it, given that these 50,000 are volunteers. Um, so it, it can be up there. But we're, we're at an op tempo now, an operations tempo now, that has a Team Rubicon team deployed round the clock somewhere in the world right now. I don't know where it might be because I no longer keep my finger on the pulse, but I guarantee you there is at least one Team Rubicon team deploying to a disaster right now. I think I saw Warno a couple of days ago about storms in Missouri. I bet we're on the ground there helping those guys out. Thanks for the question. Well, thank you so much, everyone. 
really an incredible honor uh, to come out and share this with you. Um, would, would love to come back at some point. Uh, honored to be here. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much for, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, and I will say for the record, I, it's been a while since I've seen a crowd this large. So you're, 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 uh, Thank you. doing well. I do have one quick announcement before we finish for the evening. Um, I think, do you, do you all know Dan Hollihan back here, the excessively hairy guy in the, in the corner here? He is the, uh, he is the gentleman that does all the hard work for this and actually has to come up with speakers. Uh, and I would, I would ask a favor. Uh, our success for over a decade has been a result of, of being able to get great speakers, and we're always looking for leads in that regard. So if you have some great stories that you'd like to tell, or you know someone uh, who you think would be a, a, a great speaker, uh, please let us know. Uh, and, and Dan is the guy to talk to. I'm here once in a while. He's here all the time. So uh, please let us know if, if you uh, have any leads on that. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please drive safely on the way home. Have a good evening.